What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about something that fits my bias. Ice cream could be healthy for you. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for ice cream rhythm, algorithm, algorithm, ice cream rhythm, ice cream rhythm. There was an article published in the Atlantic that I think just dropped like today or yesterday as of filming this video. Very interesting article and it's very long and I don't want to go into the long specifics of it, but basically it is an article about how for 30 years there has been a consistent protective effect of ice cream against type 2 diabetes and amongst people who have type 2 diabetes, protective effect against heart disease in the literature and it's basically been buried. So this was first observed, I believe in like the late 90s or early 2000s by a team of research scientists at Harvard. And they looked at people's uh, nutritional intakes, the different types of foods they ate, and they looked at the risk of developing type two diabetes and some other things. And they found that ice cream consumption was associated with about a 20% decrease risk of type two diabetes. And amongst people who got type two diabetes or were overweight or obese, it seemed to be protective against them developing heart disease. You could explain this away as, well, this is just a data artifact. This is obviously BS, like there's no way ice cream's healthy. But then another team did some similar analysis and found a similar effect. And then since then, there have been multiple studies done looking at the association of, it's mostly looking at the association of dairy with type two diabetes risk, with heart disease risk. But when they pull out dairy-based desserts, which are mostly ice cream, like puddings in there, but for the most part, it associates with ice cream intake. There is a consistent protective effect. In fact, the protective effect is basically the same as drinking skim or low fat milk or eating yogurt. Now what has been promoted to the public has been yogurt is healthy, skim milk, low fat milk is healthy. You'll have anti-dairy people who will go nuts over this, but that's what's been promoted to the public. And overall, I think that yogurt and low fat dairy are relatively healthy sources of high quality protein. And especially when it comes to things like Greek yogurt, not only are you getting high protein and if you're using skim or low fat, you're having a low calorie based, high protein, high quality protein source, but you're also getting like the bacterial cultures, which may also have some benefit as well. So that's been what you've heard about in the literature. But why has nobody talked about this effect of ice cream? In short, it's because nutrition scientists were scared to talk about this. Because if they do, they know they're gonna be called hacks. In fact, I found this on Twitter and people in the comments are just immediately dismissing it. This study is BS, this study is BS. How interesting that a consistent effect found in the literature must be BS, but when a carnivore crazy finds one correlation study that fits their bias, it is the greatest study in the history of mankind. Do I think ice cream really has a protective effect against like type two diabetes and heart disease? I kind of doubt it, but I'm also not willing to say that it's BS because it is a consistent effect that's being found in the literature. If we look at ice cream, amongst carbohydrate sources, people focus on the sugar, but the glycemic index is actually lower than like bread or some other sources of carbohydrate. Now, I'm not a big fan of the glycemic index, but I'm just throwing out plausible explanations for this kind of stuff. There is something to be talked about when it comes to this, and that is the possibility of reverse causation. Now, most people don't think about this, but let me explain reverse causation to you in the following way. My guess is that being over six foot three probably has a 98% correlation with playing in the NBA. You could make the conclusion that playing NBA basketball makes you tall because you have that association. But what is more likely? Well, what's more likely is that being tall makes you more predisposed to play in professional basketball. And how would we determine this empirically? Well, you would do a randomized control trial of people across various heights who start playing basketball and observe if people who play basketball versus people who don't play basketball, when they are randomized, whether or not the people who play basketball end up taller on average. And what you would see is they don't 
and it's reverse causation. Now with nutrition, it's a little bit more difficult to do that because you can't just do a 10 year randomized control trial of nutrition. Nobody's gonna sign up for that. Nobody's gonna to wanna to do that. And when you're looking at things like disease risk, you have to measure it over the course of decades because it takes time to develop these non-communicable diseases like type two diabetes and heart disease. If you just look at one year, it's unlikely you're going to see big differences between groups, even if there are big differences in the nutritional quality. So in these studies, there is a possibility of reverse causation. For example, people who have developed obesity or type two diabetes might have been told to cut back on their ice cream intake. And so what you're actually seeing is reverse causation because they're reducing their ice cream intake. They already have type two diabetes and this shows up as an effect of protection of ice cream on type two diabetes. That being said, in some of these studies, they tried to adjust for some of those co-founders and they did in fact see the effect reduce, but it still remained as a significant effect. So even accounting for reverse causation, there still seems to be some effect. Now, another possibility is we do know that people who are overweight, obese, or type two diabetic are much more likely to underreport what they consume. And so when you're dealing with nutritional epidemiology, what you're looking at is usually food frequency questionnaires where they're asking them, hey, how many servings of this do you consume per week? How many servings of this do you consume per week? And people are answering. Shocker, a lot of people don't answer honestly. And the people who are the most likely to underreport their dessert and sweets intake are people who are overweight or obese or have type two diabetes. And so again, this could confound these results, demonstrating that when it comes to nutritional epidemiology, it's a great place to jump off to start asking questions, but drawing conclusions from epidemiology is always risky. Now, what I will say with probably relative confidence is it's unlikely ice cream is going to cause or contribute to type two diabetes based on this literature. If it did, we'd at least see a few different studies that are in disagreement with this. But again, this effect has been relatively consistent in the literature. And it also highlights how much personal bias influences what gets published and what gets talked about. Basically, this research got buried for 30 years because people were like, ah, if we talk about it, people are gonna say we're crazy, they're gonna say the study is BS, and nobody's gonna believe the rest of our data, so let's talk about yogurt and skim milk because that feels better. You know, I recall back when I was in graduate school, one of my first experiments was we gave whey protein to uh, rodents, and we were looking at the time course of muscle protein synthesis. Rats tend to be an actually really good human model for muscle protein synthesis. And what I expected to see was however long the amino acid leucine, which is responsible for triggering muscle protein synthesis, however long leucine in the branched chain amino acid stayed up in the blood would be how long muscle protein synthesis ran. And at that time, I ate very frequently. I ate every two hours because I was trying to keep these levels of amino acids high all the time. And when I got the data back, it was different than what I thought it would be. In fact, muscle protein synthesis only lasted about three hours but at the three hour mark, when muscle protein synthesis had come back to baseline, the amino acid levels were still maxed out. And I looked at all kinds of different things to try to explain this. I looked at the initiation factors, mTOR signaling, intracellular levels of amino acids, and the effect was consistent every time. And I reran the blood amino acid levels probably half a dozen times because I didn't believe my own data because it conflicted with my personal bias. And I went to my advisor, Dr. Don Lehman, and he had one of the great quotes that I will still remember to this day. It sounds like you're trying to change the data to fit your conclusion, and what you need to do is change your conclusion to fit the data. And I really had a moment of cognitive dissonance. My bias was we should eat protein sources very frequently to keep amino acid levels elevated. Now I was looking at this data that suggested that the way I was eating was wrong, or not necessarily wrong, but unnecessary. So I changed the way I ate. 
based on my own data. I actually started consuming uh, a little bit bigger boluses of protein a little bit less frequently. So before that, I'd eat seven, eight meals a day, every two to three hours. And after that, I ate four to five meals a day, sometimes three meals a day, consuming them every four to six hours. And you know what? I still made gains. And in some ways, I felt better. In some ways, it was much more conducive to my lifestyle because every time I left the house, I didn't have to stuff a protein bar in my pocket. What I wanna emphasize here is true scientists. I'm not blaming these guys because I understand why they hid this data. This is like when I talk about how sugar didn't cause the obesity crisis and I show mountains of human randomized control trials that show exactly that. People get really angry and they say nasty things about me and my mom and my pets and it really hurts my feelings. But please keep doing it because you're just feeding the algorithm. Point being, a lot of people would be scared to talk about this stuff because they don't want to have conflict with people who think they already know the answers. And the reality is, all of us, myself included, always need to realize that we can have ideas of what the answers are, but we should care more about getting the right answer than we do about being right. And so I've had my moment of cognitive dissonance where I didn't believe my own data. And I changed the way I thought based on the data rather than trying to ignore the data or skew the data or, God forbid, some scientists do this, just change the data and lie about it. Because my personal bias is not as important as the truth. And I want you to keep that in mind when you're picking who you follow for fitness influencers. Now that being said, I'm feeling hungry. Time for a bowl of ice cream. Catch you guys later.